Hey everybody, this week I'm spotlighting an organization called Restaurant Opportunities Centers United, whose pandemic response fund is providing direct cash assistance to restaurant workers across the country. According to their website, the fund has served as a lifeline to more than 5,000 restaurant workers and their families affected by the pandemic. To date, we have provided emergency cash assistance that helps these workers purchase their groceries, fill their prescriptions, pay their bills, and meet their other essential needs. This podcast will be making a donation to the Restaurant Opportunity Center's United Pandemic Response Fund, and I hope you'll consider doing the same. You can go to their website, rocunited.org, to learn more and click the link under Our Pandemic Response Efforts to donate. Thanks, and here's the rest of the show. Stay for Dinner, a podcast of cooking, curiosity, and conversation. If you love cooking, hate cooking, have no idea how you feel about cooking because you've never tried it before, congratulations, you are in the right place. I am DC Pearson. I am an author, comedian, and enthusiastic home cook. And when people think about home cooking, oftentimes they think about Grandmas. Grandmas are the Jedi of the home cooking world. And to celebrate them, I have been chatting with some grandmas of my own in a few of the uh, past couple episodes. And though I still have one that I, I need to nail down and get on the show, today is a very special episode because today, Haley Hepworth, comedian, writer, performer and person that I am married to will be getting on the phone with her grandma, Paula, who I am just insanely fond of. Paula is the best. I love hearing them together and I think you will too. Haley is hoping to get a download of Paula's famous marble bunt cake recipe and This should be very interesting because part of what makes the cake famous in their family, besides it being really good and being made for every special occasion in their family, is that it frequently falls apart when Paula is taking it out of the pan. Like it's a, it's like a legendary thing in their family. And this cake is, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's a blessing and a curse, but it's like a blessing with a curse. And hopefully today, Haley will get to the bottom of it. Her grandma can get to the bottom of it and they can, uh, you know, just, just figure out what the deal is and then pass the cake on to the next few generations because it it deserves to be. It's that, it's that good, whether it's in one piece or three pieces. And then Haley is going to try to make the cake right here on the show. There are so many questions. Why does it always fall apart? And more importantly, why do we keep coming back for more anyway? Haley is going to call her grandma in Idaho right now and find out. This call All is right. now being recorded. All okay. right. Pressure's on now. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the recipes. The one that you mentioned earlier was the marble bunt cake. I have that. It is a yes, the famous marble bunt cake. Yes, is that the one you want, Haley? Other than that, I'll take it. I mean, that one's such a. It's a classic. Lots of memories of that one. Well, it's what I'm known for. Yes, good and bad is right. Anyway, do you have a pencil? Oh, yes, I have a pencil. Also, it's being recorded. Okay. <laughs> okay, one white cake, yellow works if you don't have white. So is this like a box cake mix, or what's your preference? What's yes. the Paula secret? Uh, the Paula secret is you start with a box cake mix and a box. <laughs> <laughs> and a box of um, instant pistachio pudding, the small uh-huh. size. Those are both things you can just purchase at the grocery store. Perfect. I'm giving I'm giving you the list of ingredients. The Excellent. Next is I three, am writing. Three, okay, three quarters of a cup of orange juice, a right. cup of water, 
Got it. A cup of vegetable oil or corn oil or, you know, I wouldn't use olive oil. A neutral cooking oil. Yeah. Yes, yes. (laughs) And four eggs. Then you mix them all well. So you just mix everything all up at once? Yes, yes. And, uh, I mean, a tip that you're supposed to know, which I never did for a long time, is when you're using a box cake mix, you don't want to over mix it. So mm. just mix, mix it enough that it's, you don't see any of the flour in it. Aha, no lumps and bumps. Uh-huh. And and you should you should have your bunt pan already prepared and set. So what to do you go. mean by prepared? What what All constitutes right. prepared? I know you're a bit of a bunt pan expert, so not I want the really. method. Not really. Well, <laughs> I'm teasing what's you. Imp- I know you are because uh, if you don't prepare it properly, when it comes out, it will come out not as a cake, but as a quarter or a half a cake. You want to have it well. Use your same kind of oil. And, you know, you use a piece of paper towel, just a little, and you put oil on it. And you make sure that it's all over, every nook, every crevice, every bit of that bunt pan. Now, just hypothetically... If you maybe are really busy or you're working fast and you forget this step, I not that this has ever happened to you, that's when you're saying you end up with half a cake or a quarter cake because the other half gets stuck in there? If you don't, if you don't use enough oil. If you think, oh, I'm Mm -hmm. going to cut calories by not using too much oil, it's it's going to, of course, you're making a cake, <laughs> but uh, that's when it sticks. That uh-huh. So when you liberally I mean, it's such put, a small amount of oil to coat. I can't imagine that's calorically significant. I, I know, but that's when you've been watching your weight your whole life. This is how your mind works, but you don't yeah, want to cut enough. corners. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So, now this is a a little tricky. You're going to, into the prepared pan, you're going to pour in a half to a third, or no, half to two-thirds of the batter. So, you have to kind of eye it. And at this point, it's kind of the light green pistachio batter? It's That's it, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, let's say a half to two-thirds, but anywhere in between. And then after that's in the pan, then you're going to get this, and you do not have this in the initial list of ingredients, your Hershey's chocolate. Uh Uh-huh. Chocolate uh, syrup? Yes. Your Hershey's chocolate syrup, eight-ounce can, and you're going to add to that to your remaining batter. All eight ounces? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you're going to mix that well, and then you have to pour it evenly over the first batter. Go all the way. You're pouring now all the way around the bunt pan, but don't mix it. Just as it bakes, what will happen is it will go down, and it's going to make a pretty design. Mm Mm-hmm. Sort of the marble effect. That's right. And then you're going to bake it in a 350 oven, which we should have turned on. We should have had the oven turned on already. And it says 50 to to 55 minutes. However, that's when you use the smell test. When you can smell the cake, then you can look at it. You can peek. And if it's, it will be already all the way to the top of the bunt pan, it will have raised. And when the top is a light brown, now you can't, you can't go too soon. I would say it's at least 35 minutes or maybe 45 minutes, but never the 50 to 55 or it's overbaked. When you say the smell test, what are you smelling for? 
well, what you're going to smell is like when you're baking anything, cookies or a cake or anything. You're in the other room. The buzzer hasn't gone. Mm, but you can smell what you're baking. And that mm -hmm. is a clue that it might be ready. And that's when you check. And, of course, you can use the little toothpick or any kind uh -huh. of a, 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 a to poke it in the top and make sure when it comes out that none of the batter is left on the toothpick. You do that for any cake. But I don't really think it's necessary on this cake. Um, then this cake could have a, a chocolate glaze with nuts. My mother has written, for fancy. Well, <laughs> I've never made it. I, I've never made it for fancy. But I was going to say, I never remember the for fancy variation. In all my years of no. eating this cake, I guess no. I've never been considered fancy. <laughs> well, because I don't think it's there. Anyway, now the tricky <laughs> part is, when do I take it out of the pan? And what I do generally is you'll find like a bottle of ketchup or a bottle of, there aren't soda bottles anymore, but some kind of a bottle and you invert, the, you let it cool a little while and then you invert it on the bottle huh, so that it can. Heard of this. Well, I don't know. This is a very no, old recipe. But anyway, that's what you do. You don't have to. If you, you can just put it on some kind of a platform, but the idea so is the to idea get air off. Well, the idea of inverting it. Mm -hmm. well, right, and it gets it cooled. Yes. Yes. You want to cool it completely. It takes more than an hour. But it doesn't I don't drop all, out? I don't, well, there's, that's a little tricky too. You can do it. <laughs> Are you sure you want this recipe? Yes. <laughs> this is why sometimes it doesn't work. No, I, I think maybe the inverting it on a bottle is something you won't do. I think you will put it on some kind of <laughs> You want to get air all the way around it. Forget the bottle. <laughs> I mean, I'm hearing about this bottle method, which I do think is very interesting, but it is making me wonder, just if you have it. For, the, for the listeners at home, there's a, such a long and storied history of mishaps with this cake. With this cake. Yeah. And I'm and this is, I'm learning about this bottle method. I guess I'm just wondering if it's sitting face up the way that it would have been poured and baked. Mm -hmm. Is there what uh, what air is it getting if it's upside down and still in the pan that it's not getting if it's right side up and still in the pan? Well, all right. If it's right side up, the bottom of it is is going to be on some kind of a surface. Now that you can also, if you have some kind of a stripe, that air will get through. Um, I'm trying to remember what like it's called. Like a cookie thing. rack or something? It, a rack. Put, you you can now, just put it on a question. rack. Okay. This might be controversial, but what if we put it on a ketchup bottle right side up? Wouldn't it be getting the same amount of air that, flow give it without a try. the risk? Haley, give it a try. See how it'll work. <laughs> I'll give it a try. <laughs> I don't no, want to, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't mean you don't to, want it to mess with flipping out. I'm no. just wondering if we have decades of sort of, you know, cakes half in the experience pan. <laughs> with this bottle method and with the upside down cake falling out <laughs> in pieces. So, hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically. Yes, yeah, so let's. Let's not do the bottle. <laughs> oh, oh my! Oh my! <laughs> so put it on a rack. <laughs> but then the tricky part is, 
when you're going to invert it so it's correct, you take right. your dish, put it on the top, and then flip it over and pray that it works. But it will. <laughs> it will. There are times, and, and the main thing, reason why I've had trouble is I'm always in too much of a hurry. I let it sit for, say, an hour, and I think, oh, that's ready, and I'm cleaning up the kitchen, and then I just do it too soon, and that's when I have my disasters. What disasters? When the cake doesn't all come out right. <laughs> so, so right. So in that can, case, it's maybe still a little bit warm. It's not fully set yes. in there. It's just a That's little more right. vulnerable to structural interference. Well, be, and because the, the part that that sticks in is the part where no air has gotten to it. Because right. the, the the larger top, obviously, the air is, you know, going, but the very bottom doesn't have it. So mm -hmm. make sure you put the rack, uh, use the rack. Or the ketchup bottle. Or the ketchup bottle. I have to you do might, a bottle now. You have to practice with that, with something <laughs> that you don't care about. Now, now you know why I don't make this cake much anymore. And this, right. just well, think yeah. how old this is. This was my grandmother's recipe. I'm surprised Holy cake smoke. mixes and instant pistachio pudding were invented. I think it came, this I recipe perhaps, too. it came from the 60s, I think. Mm, so she I think made it, that's she maybe when, didn't grow up with it, but she made it. No, no, she did maybe. She did not grow up with it. It came from cousin Sarah, and then Grandma got it from cousin Sarah. Aha! Uh -huh. When did the recipe come into your life? Oh well, I think from the sixties. Gotcha. So you Definitely. remember kind of when it when it made its debut in the family and was maybe because I remember oh, sure. eating this cake. Usually you would make it for family birthdays or if we'd come yeah. over for like a Sunday Christ night dinner, oftentimes uh, you'd make Christmas it for Eve. Christmas I always Eve. used to make, uh, yes. Yeah. But the thing about the uh, cake is the 60s, I was already married because I got married in 59. So I didn't really perhaps learn all these tips. I had to kind of do, go at it by myself when I started making it, which was some years later. And, you know, I've had my share of disasters with it. You're brave to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, but it's worth it because when it works, it works. You know, and it's, it's, it's so it's good. very showy. It's very showy mm -hmm. when you cut it. Beautiful. When you cut into it, then it's supposed to be beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. If it does come out um, fractured, what well, what do you do in that then, case? Well, the, perhaps you haven't been there when I've taken it, and I, maybe it's not real recent years. I've taken the cake in pieces. I mean, I've you been know. there. I'm asking for the audience at home. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> Give them a little peek behind bring, the curtain. Y yes, I, I bring <laughs> the part that came out, and I bring the pan with the other half in it. And then I give you a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> and it tastes just as good. Great. It really does. And it's, all, and it's almost always served with vanilla ice cream. Mm -hmm. Not always, but that kind of helps if it looks funny. You put a scoop <laughs> on the top. <laughs> yeah, you you got to draw the eye to the ice cream. Right. Oh, the hey, ice cream hey. starts melting. Everything else gets blurred. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh boy. So you you know you're saying you kind of learned this recipe in the 60s when you were already sort of newly married. What are when you were growing up? Did you cook? Did you cook, or where did you learn generally about cooking? Because I think you know you oh. obviously are an accomplished oh. cook. Where did you well, learn that, or where did you see that? Uh, I observed. 
I, I really never cooked at home. My job was always make the salad, Paula, because mm. my grandmother went to school. Um, they call, it was like it wasn't a vocational school, but that's in essence what it was. She went to school and she learned about cooking. And then my mother was a home ec major at the university. My sister was a home ec major at the university. And I took education. So you see, I really, I, I just learned by watching, but they didn't let me do anything. Make the salad, Paula. Uh, <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> so uh, I've I've learned because we had to. I mean, you know, and then I yeah. didn't live close. I didn't live close. So, and each kind of decade has their own. It used to be when I was first married, casseroles. Everybody was eating casseroles. But each, it, as time has evolved, there are periods when you eat a lot of one thing and then you know, and then all the prepackaged things came into existence. Um, so I've just kind of gone with the flow, and you can really, even now with this COVID thing, you can go and get food at a restaurant and bring it home. Although I must say, we haven't done that at all. We've just been had people bring us deliver the groceries. That's so interesting. I didn't realize you were the salad that you had that salad sort well, of designation. Do you have salad tips or go-tos? Because no. I think of you as making a good salad. Oh, nowadays it's so easy to have all these great packages of salad. And uh, I don't, I'm not at all that, you know, for, I still like the wrong kind of lettuce because it keeps longer when there are only two of you a head of lettuce will last us almost a week. And when you're asking people to bring you groceries, you don't want to say, oh, bring me some arugula and give, bring me some romaine and do all this. So we eat, we eat quite simply. What do you mean by the wrong kind of lettuce? Well, head lettuce, iceberg lettuce. That is, mm. people now think that's, oh, you only use that for like a taco or something. Well, if, if you do the head of lettuce and don't cut it, but just break it off, it keeps for a long time. Yeah. Um, well, and it has so its that, place, like you were saying. So you were saying kind of over time, you know, the food trends kind of come and go and, you know, things change and evolve over time as to sort of what's in vogue. Yes. And I was just going to say, when you're newly married, you can do most anything, depending on how much cooking you want to do. But then when you have children, you have to, you hope they will eat what you do, but some of the things aren't one bit practical for children, so you're cooking differently. And then people that are working don't have as much time, so you go more for things you can make quickly. And then when you get to be retired and elderly, you're looking at the sodium content and uh, the, you know, the fat content. You're trying to eat more healthfully so you live longer. It's it's a different way of cooking as years go on. Yeah, that makes sense. I was thinking just about, you know, you were mentioning that you had just been recently reading over some recipes that you make around Christmas time. And obviously, we have our cookie tradition. Where did those cookies yes. come from? The the Christmas cookies, like the dainties the and the cookies. The Christmas, they're, they're from, uh, the dainties came from one of my mother's friends. That's a, a very, very old recipe. Um, I think I started making the pixies. They were easy. And then as I would try to have a new kind of cookie every year, and I haven't really done that too much lately. Um, well, there have been several in the rotation. You know, we the past many yeah. years you've done the almond cookies, or for a while yeah. you were doing sort of those little, the like haystack sort of cookies. I don't know what you call those. Those yes. are good. Uh, yes, that's easy. You see, the, and you don't have to have the oven for those. 
That's uh-huh. why. So what I tried to make the dainties, so I think um, I maybe even on this show before have mentioned the dainties, that they're sort of this almond shortbread sort of, is that accurate? Well, it is kind of, a, you know, it's butter and sugar and flour with the ground almonds or hazelnuts and a little vanilla. That's all that's in it. Uh, and right. then you roll them and chill them, and then you you have the flavor of the sugar and cinnamon that you roll them in after. You now, I tried to make them. them a couple years ago, and I I think maybe I just wasn't as experienced with cookie baking, but I could not, I failed. I could not get the dough to, it was too dry and crumbly. I couldn't get it to stick together. Do, do you do the butter at a certain temperature or something where it's, I was thinking, you know, sometimes that can make a difference if it's cold versus if it's room temperature or something like that? I don't know. What are the, what are the secrets? <laughs> well, the, the secret the secret to it is you have the butter soft, and mm-hmm. you cream it with the sugar, and you're using half a pound of butter and only a fourth of a cup of sugar, and then you have to have it chilled. You now how do we do that? I can't remember exactly. We have to, oh, we chill the dough. I have the dough mm-hmm. thoroughly chilled, and then I cut the – it's in a bowl, and so I cut it in fourths, and then I take a fourth out, and I mold it with my hands into a long cylinder. And then, ah. you ha- and then I put that in the freezer. Um, very carefully so it sticks together and it can be in the refrigerator it depends how if you just normally a refrigerator is fine but i'm always in a hurry i so you chill it thoroughly and then you cut it interesting so i knew that it was chilled before we cut it into the you know cut it off the logs Mm -hmm. into sort of the cookie coins but i did not realize there was a step you know where it's like you want the butter at room temp when you're creaming mm-hmm. it to make the base of the dough, but I didn't realize that then you chill the dough before you roll it into the logs or form it into the yes. logs. That yes. is interesting. That makes sense. I feel like that's where I ran into it. Remember see, seeing the bowl and where I cut it in force? Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe you see it. I think the truth of the matter is I probably do that all before you come to bake. You do. I want yes. It. I feel like yes. by the time so. we get there, the logs are – Chilled, and they're formed yes, and chilled yeah. and ready to go, ready yeah. for slicing. Okay, so the secret is, the, in the bowl, you put the the dough and then you kind of press it down, so it's all not congealed, but it's hard, and then you chill it, and then when you get to take it out to make the logs, is when I cut it into fourths. Aha. Uh-huh. Gotcha. So then you end up with four rolls. Yes. Yes. And it's also better to have the rolls not be too long because then they break. Sure. That makes sense. Have you ever made one big, tried to make one big long roll? (laughs) Never. Never. No, you want the rolls, uh, you know, to be pretty, but make them a little bit fatter and then they're easier to handle. Sure. That makes sense. Now, something else I was thinking about, just what Christmas reminded me of it, is Lefsa. So I oh, always think Lefsa. of you as, as bringing Lefsa to Christmas Eve and other gatherings, but talking about picky kids, I feel like when I was a very picky kid, that's something I loved because it's pretty, you know, it's a delicate bland. flavor. It <laughs> is bland. <laughs> now, Lefsa, Lefsa is a Norwegian flatbread. And um, it, it's my mother and my grandmother made it together because it's a two-person thing. And I think when you were like 10 years old, you and I tried to make lefse. And I'm not that sure it was. That rings a bell. Yes, I'm that not sure because I wanted you to know how to do it. But I'm mm-hmm. not that great at it myself. 
Uh, so in the recent years, I go to the Norwegian Lutheran Church Bazaar and buy the lefse. Uh-huh. And then I go home and butter it and roll it up. And that's <laughs> my secret. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's delicious. I tried to, I can't remember if I told you about this. I made lefse, or I tried to make lefse maybe about two or three years ago. DC and I mm. have an Oscar party. And for the Oscar party for the past couple of years, we've done a theme of some sort. And a couple mm-hmm. years ago, we did a theme where we made different types of pancakes and flatbreads from all over the world. And so okay. one that I attempted was the lefse, and it was hard. It was hard. It, I think it, it is hard. It's hard because the dough is when so wet. And then when you go to roll it, it sticks, and exactly. you have to keep you have to keep flouring it, and it's a lot of work. Uh, and then yes, rolling I, it out, rolling it out is is uh, they want they have it real thin. Uh, but yeah, I the saw they have is, special yeah. presses for it that they use, almost like a tortilla press no, or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, there's um, no, it's it's not. There's no press involved. There are cookies that are pressed. But this yeah, maybe that's is what I'm of. just rolled. I can do <laughs> less of, but it's way too much work. Yeah, I mean that dough. I, it sounds like what I found when I tried to do it, which is just the stickiness of the dough because it's potato, right? Yeah. So it's <clears throat> and flour. Me, so it's, it's basically potato, potato and, and flour. flour. So it's so mm-hmm. sticky and starchy, and m- m- there's so much moisture in that dough that it. Yeah, it was almost impossible to get it. You, you're rolling out such a small amount to make a single lefse roll, and it's and it's so labor intensive to get it to roll out flat enough, thin enough without sticking. And then you look at the bowl of all the dough that you have left to get through, and that can be a depressing moment. <laughs> I bet. I bet. No, that's really tough. But but it's well, hard we may to have do. To yeah, we'll we have, have a lefse preparing. I can, we can do that, <laughs> Haley. We can, we can. Sure. I, we may have to experiment with it. Get back in the test yeah. kitchen now that I'm older and <laughs> figure it out. Do you have any go-tos right now? Things that you've been enjoying making uh, recently? Uh, you know, when we get a Costco chicken that's already prepared, rotisserie and pre- prepared. Um, oh yeah. We eat it just regular to begin with, and then I take the chicken off the bones, and then I make broth. I make chicken broth, and then once you have the chicken broth made, then you're going to make chicken soup. So I we had that last night, and you can do all kinds of different things, you know, with potatoes or noodles or whatever. Rice. Ours last night was was. Uh, chicken rice soup. I especially like soup when it's not 99 degrees as it is here today. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that makes I, sense. Oh, one thing I just thought of that I just remembered that I always loved that I wanted to ask you the origins of is when we would come over to your house, especially around the holidays or for an occasion, you would often on the dining room table have, you know, you do a nice tablecloth that has sort of the lace pattern, and then you would put mm-hmm. a bunch of little red hot, red hot candy oh, that, that in is, all the little that, holes in the lace. Well, but you can do it with just a plain white linen cloth, too. It's the idea of you put the red hots around, and then it's kind of like uh, an early dessert. I know my dad was always eating them. Um, yeah, that is a, so the that idea is you a can tradition. just munch on them at any gathering at any point. Sure, sure. I certainly did. Uh, Where did you learn that? Uh, I, I that came from a grandmother. I'm I'm sure. Uh, I don't know which one. It must have been his mother. Um, <laughs> but that was like a decoration. You had a white cloth, and you'd have red candles and the red hot and maybe some greens or holly or something and then the red hots around 
And when you came to put everything on the table, you just kind of moved the red, red hots out of the way so you had room for your serving dishes. Interesting. Well, I love that tradition. we got to bring it back. i got to try well, to some red hots. It's, it's kind of cute, and, and you can get them. Uh, generally, I find them at the drugstore, rather, the drugstore candy, rather than the grocery store. Uh, I don't uh-huh. know if that's just in this area, but, I mean, they have had them at Albertsons, but it's more of a certainty at the drugstore candy. Interesting. Well, I'll have to look for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then oh, I boy. save well, whatever I left. I save from year to year. <laughs> because I mean, sometimes... they don't go bad. No, they don't. <laughs> Haley, this has been fun reminiscing. I know. Thank you for chatting with me, and thank you for sharing the bunt cake recipe. I will let you know how it goes, and I'll send you some footage. I may have to do some ketchup bottle experiments. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, uh, <laughs> it doesn't I'll have to be the a, findings for you. I'll well, record the, the ketchup, findings. We always had a ketchup bottle. Uh, any bottle will do. So, okay. Okay. All hello right. to DC. Well, thank you. Say hello to Grandpa, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye, Haley. Thanks for chatting. Bye. Okay. Hello. Here we are in the tiny apartment kitchen. As you've just heard, I believe, I spoke to my grandma and got her. Famous recipe for marble bundt cake. Uh, It's pistachio and chocolate, and it's very delicious. We had it for a lot of celebratory family gatherings growing up, Christmas Eve, birthdays, things like that, which feels fitting because today is my dad's birthday. He's in another state. We won't be able to eat this cake with him, unfortunately, but we will eat it in honor of him. So to start us out, Uh, I am going to start with our wet ingredients. I feel like something that I have kind of learned. Oops. Oh boy. What did I do? Hmm. Knocked something down with the wire from the recorder. Uh, Something that I've learned in more recent years is with baking, oftentimes as you're getting the ingredients for like a dough or a batter together to start with the wet ingredients together and the dry ingredients together, and then that usually has a better textural sort of experience when you're then integrating them. I'm not exactly sure why, but it makes intuitive sense in practice. Uh, So today we're gonna start with four eggs. I like to start with eggs first, if they're gonna be in a dough or batter or something like this, um, where you're just, they go in at the same time as the other ingredients, I feel like. With a cookie dough, oftentimes you kind of make the base of the dough with like butter and sugar, and then later you whip the eggs in at that at a specific point in the process. But with this batter, it's kind of a free for all. So I like to start with the eggs because then I can kind of whisk them before we add the other ingredients and get them to a nice smooth place so you don't have a batter and notice like, oh, there's a big lump of egg mucus kind of doing its own thing that hasn't been very well integrated. But as my grandma instructed, we don't want to over mix this cake batter. So I'm going to take the opportunity now to add our four eggs and get them nice and whisked. Mm-hmm. All right. So the eggs are in the bowl. They are nice and whisked up and relatively homogenous. Uh, Usually at my grandma's house, if we were ever making something, she would do it with a little hand beater and then we would get to lick the batter off the hand beater, which is one of life's truest pleasures. So now we're gonna add, what are we doing now? We're doing three quarters of a cup of orange juice, which it's, I feel like the, the cake doesn't really have an orangey taste. It doesn't come through in a really direct way, but it makes sense that it's in there, probably to add flavor and a little brightness. 
I'm just doing store-bought orange juice. Though I bet fresh squeezed orange juice would be even better. All right, now we're gonna do one cup of vegetable oil and one cup of water. Hey, line. Um, I feel like in high school one time for a friend's birthday, my friend Aaron Malay and I made some cupcakes that we were very excited about and we didn't understand that when it said oil, it meant a neutral oil like vegetable oil or corn oil or something like that. So we ended up using olive oil because that was kind of the preferred cooking oil at my house. And the cake ended up tasting very grassy. Um, not ideal, not recommended. I, there are some cakes that are olive oil cakes where that's explicitly part of the flavor. And I feel like when you're doing that, maybe you use a nicer olive oil or something. Um, but yeah, in that, in that instance, it was a bust. Um, all right, so we've just added a cup of our vegetable oil. Um, my lovely assistant, you may hear squeaking in the background, is our cat Linus, who has joined me and is feeling very talkative this afternoon. All right, now we're gonna add a cup of water. All right. So we've got all of our wet ingredients going, I'm pretty sure. We've got to review our eggs, our orange juice, our vegetable oil, and our water. So we have a nice wet ingredient mix going on. Uh, now we can add some of our dry ingredients. So I'm gonna first add a box of pistachio jello mix, um, which <laughs> is a great little uh, way to get that pistachio flavor. It's funny, I was wondering about it. What's in this stuff? We got sugar, cornstarch, almonds. Huh, sure. Um, and then a bunch of chemicals. Um, but hey, <laughs> the flavor is great. And the, the texture, I'm guessing that doing the jello mix not only gets the pistachio flavor in there, but also adds some sort of texture with like the cornstarch and the, oh yeah. Hmm. It's bright green. As my grandma said, this is a recipe from the sixties. Uh -huh. So we're mixing it into our <laughs> mixture and it has a very bright artificial green color, but that's mixing with the yellow uh, of the liquid mixture. That's the yellow color from the orange juice. And it's turning into kind of a nice, uh, very yellowy green, but tasteful. Uh. <laughs> oh yeah. So we got that and it's still the mixture with the addition of that powder has thickened up a little bit, um, but it's still definitely liquid. Uh, so now we're going to add the white cake mix. We're just doing a box cake mix. What does it have in there? We got flour, sugar, corn syrup, uh, baking soda, you know, kind of the basics of if you're making a little cake. Oh yeah, that has, <laughs> it has that real like birthday cake smell to it. I don't know exactly what that is. I haven't made a box cake in a long time, uh, but it has that real unmistakable good smell. I feel like it's kind of vanilla-y, but it's in the dry mix. Normally I add vanilla in like a liquid extract. So I don't know where that scent comes from, but it's very, yeah, it's reminiscent of like birthday parties growing up. Good little smell. All right, so I've just added the dry cake mix into the batter. Oh shoot, I did exactly what she said not to do, which is I forgot to preheat the oven before we started. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna preheat the oven to 350. All right, done. The oven is preheated to 350, which I feel like is a pretty standard temperature for a lot of cakes and cookies and stuff, baked goods. All right. 
So we've added the box cake mix, given it a little stir to kind of get it integrated into this light green batter. Oh yeah, I feel like the white of the cake mix, maybe just the sort of opaque quality of it is really helping the green. It's amplifying the green coloring in here. Mm -hmm. It's giving it that white backdrop and kind of really, really letting it shine and come through. It also looks like there are a couple little tiny pieces of, I guess they probably want us to think pistachio uh, that are in here from the jello mix, but I you know, look from the packaging like it might be, in fact, almonds. But they're in such tiny pieces, you can't really tell. All right, so. As per my grandma's instructions, I don't want to overwork this batter. There are still a couple little lumps, but it's mostly integrated. And so, all right, that's great. I'm going to let it do its thing for a second. We'll do a little lick to make sure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, tastes good. Um, I, I'm not squeamish ever about eating doughs or batters that have raw eggs in them, even though we should be, right? I don't know. Maybe it'll come back to bite me at some point, but eh. All right, so now while we wait for the oven to finish preheating, we are going to undertake <laughs> one of the most important parts of this process, as we discussed, which is prepping the bunt pan. So as you may have gleaned from my discussion with my grandma, she has a long and storied history of making bunt cakes that fall apart or that get half stuck in the pan, <laughs> which is a heartbreaker. Um, usually I try to be very, very um, thorough about coating any sort of bakeware that I'm using. Honestly, probably because I've learned from her. We've all experienced <laughs> the heartbreaks, the setbacks of her bunt career. And so she's instilled in us how important it is to really, really coat your pan well. So I usually, sometimes if I'm baking something where I've used like a stick of butter in the recipe, I'll just use the empty um, like butter wrapper if it has a decent little coating of butter still on it. Instead of throwing it away, I'll use that to kind of rub down a pan. Um, but with this recipe, since it doesn't have any butter, I am using just a paper towel that I have dabbed some oil onto and really getting in there. Yeah, she's right about these bunt pans. They have all these little crevices, which are fantastic because that makes a beautiful, elegant design. But it also just creates all the more little shapes and surfaces for something to potentially stick to and it makes it really hard. I feel like sometimes if you're making a cake in a loaf pan or something, you can kind of stick a knife around the edge after it's done baking and use that to kind of help the cake clear the pan a little bit, loosen it up in there. But I feel like that would be pretty impossible with this bunt pan to employ that method and not totally ruin the shape, and even I think probably would be pretty hard to get a knife into some of these little crevices. But we're given the entire interior of the bunt pan, all surfaces in there, a really nice, really nice polish with this oily paper towel. You can see, kind of hold it up a little bit and see it's shiny everywhere, which I think means everywhere is covered in oil, but there's no, you know, you don't want to be like too oily. There's no oil pooling or running or anything in there. Just coating. I guess a lot of people use a spray for this. I feel like I used one of those ones that had a really sort of artificial butter flavor going on and I didn't like it. So I don't use it. But I also know that there are plenty of them that I think are just neutral oils. So the oven is still preheating, but it sounds like it should be done in a second. So I'm going to go ahead and pour the cake. So as per her instructions, 
we're going to pour about a half to two thirds of the batter into the base of the prepared bunt pan now. And I'm going to wing it. I'm just going to eyeball it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. First, we'll, okay, let me get a good look at about how much batter we've got going on. Yeah, we have about five cups of batter. So I'll aim to get about three cups of batter in the base. Oh, yeah, there's that green batter. I'm just holding my pouring bowl in one hand. And the nice thing about this circular bunt pan is you can use your other hand to just kind of move it around <laughs> in a circle. Uh, Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. I'm going to do a little bit more because, again, you want plenty of that beautiful green going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll do a little more. There are still some lumps in this batter, but that's what she seemed to indicate to me that that's okay, that you don't want to overwork it till it's perfectly smooth, and she's the expert. So I am following instructions. So now we have a little over half the batter in the base of the bunt pan, looking light green and lovely. And then I'm going to now add the chocolate syrup to the other half of the batter that's still in the bowl. Now I got just, oh wow. Okay, yeah, no, never mind. I misread this. <laughs> So, so it sounds like she was saying that she uses a can of the Hershey's syrup. I just got the traditional bottle, which looks like it's 24 ounces. So we're only going to need a third of this. And to figure that out, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it with a kitchen scale. So instead of trying to convert it and figure out what that would be in like cups and measure that out and do the whole thing. I'm just going to turn on our kitchen scale. Mm -hmm. Put it on ounces. We know we're looking for eight ounces of this syrup. So I'm going to put the bowl with our batter on top of the scale. Okay. Do some quick math. So we're currently at four pounds and 5.3 ounces. So if we add eight ounces to that, we're going to be looking for 13.3 ounces with the addition of the chocolate syrup. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh man, this chocolate syrup is a real blast from the past. I feel like we used to have this to put on ice cream and stuff, but I have not had it in years. All right, so I'm just pouring it into the batter. I'm watching the kitchen scale to measure how much is going in. It's pretty liquidy. All right, we're looking for 13.3, we're getting close. 13.2, 13.3, all right. So we've added eight ounces of our chocolate syrup, made kind of a cool grasshoppery design <laughs> in the bowl, um, but I'm gonna mix it in so that it all becomes a brown, relatively uniform looking batter. Oh uh, yeah, mm-hmm, again. We're working not to overmix, as per instructions from the guru. All right, so now we've got our chocolate half of the batter, and I'm just gonna go ahead and pour it in over the top of the green batter. Um, again, just kind of moving it around in a circle so that it coats everywhere. And in some marble, like, I've made like marble brownies or marble blondies or things like that before, where you add the second batter over the top and then you go over with a knife or something to sort of create a pattern. We don't do that with this one. We just pour it on and then I think the weight, I think the batter must be a little bit heavier. All right, there's our oven ready right on time. Fantastic. I feel like the weight of the chocolate batter might be a little bit more so it kind of naturally, or maybe just the action of pouring it creates an effect where it kind of plunges down and breaks up the green instead of just sitting on top and creates a lovely effect, but you don't want to mix it beyond that or it, you know, would lose that effect and become too 
two combined. You want to have, when you're done here, the clear, you want to see the division in each slice of the chocolate half of the slice and the pistachio half of the slice swirling into each other without too much mixing interference. So I've just finished pouring the last of the chocolate batter into the pan. The cake should be ready to go in the oven. And as we know, the oven is ready to receive it. So we will pop it in there and start the timer. I think my bunt pan might be a little off. <laughs> it looks a little, it doesn't look perfectly circular anymore. It looks like kind of a little oval. Huh. I love a bunt cake. My friend Emily Schmidt loves a bunt cake. She's from Minnesota, so that makes sense. And I think of it as being, yeah, kind of a Midwestern classic relic of the 50s and 60s and just simple and delicious, which makes sense. My grandma is from Wisconsin, also Midwest. Um, oh boy, I gotta start my timer. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start the timer as my grandma said. So she said that the instructions say 50 to 55 minutes, but she usually sets the timer for 35 minutes to first check in on it, which I love. I always like doing the timer under, again, cause you can bake something more, but you can't bake it less. So I love checking in on it 15 to 20 minutes early cause every oven is different. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna follow her instructions. We're gonna do 35 minutes and then we will check back in on it. All right, that is the timer. So that is 35 minutes. I'm gonna check on this guy. We'll do a first check, see how it's looking. Ooh, yeah. You can see the design already on the bottom. It looks beautiful. I can see just from eyeballing it, it's jiggling still a little bit in the center. So I think it's not quite done. So I'm not gonna poke it yet because um, I know it's still a little too liquidy. So I'm gonna go ahead and add, let's just add five minutes just to be conservative rather than 10. So I'm gonna add five minutes, check on it at that point, see what's going on and uh, I'll let you know. All right, time flies. It has been another five minutes. So we're gonna go ahead and check this puppy. Uh -huh. Check it once again. We'll see. Oh yeah, it's still got a tiny jiggle to it. I think if we give it another five minutes, it'll be there is my, is my guess. So I'm gonna give it five more minutes and then we'll check in again. All right, the timer just went off again. Let's check in on this puppy. All right, yeah. It's no longer wiggling at all, so I'm gonna go ahead and take it out. So far, it is passing the smell test with flying colors. As you may recall, uh, my grandma's instructions for assessing the doneness of the cake are the smell test, smelling for when it smells done and good and like a baked cake, which it definitely does. The smell is fantastic. And now the second test, which is the toothpick test. I didn't find a toothpick, so I'm just using a chopstick, which may make a bigger hole than I would normally make for company, <laughs> but it's just me in DC, so I think we can live with it. Yeah, the top chopstick came out clean, so we are gonna call this sucker done. All right, I'm gonna turn off my oven, and now we get to an interesting part <laughs> of the process, which is famously the ketchup bottle step. Now let me go ahead and poke my head in our fridge see if we have a ketchup bottle. I don't think we do, but you know what I saw we had um, is like an old water bottle, like a glass water bottle that we use sometimes just to keep cold water in the fridge. So I'm gonna grab that really quick. So I've got kind of a big glass bottle, maybe similar in size to like a wine bottle. And now this, now we're getting to a controversial moment where, you know, my grandma suggested 
inverting the cake on the bottleneck, which I, there may, and I am extremely open to anyone who has greater knowledge of this than I, we could not think of a reason why the cake needs to be inverted in order to get the circulation of air around it that'll allow it to cool evenly. And I think we kind of discussed, at least I feel like, and she didn't argue with me, <laughs> that if we put the cake right side up on the bottleneck, which to be honest with you, at least my bunt pan, and I'm, if I'm looking at the center of it, it looks like the shape of it maybe more naturally lends itself to this right side up arrangement of balancing on the bottle. We can't see why that would be less effective at getting that air circulation than the inverted method, but it does seem less dangerous than the inverted method as far as having the cake fall out of the pan partially and break. So, so I'm gonna go ahead with my grandma's blessing and put the cake on the bottle right side up. Oh yeah, it fits quite nicely on there. Honestly, with the bottle I've chosen, it fits right on there. Oh yeah, looks great. And then we will leave it to cool in this, uh, <laughs> we'll leave it to cool here, suspended up in the air on the bottle, hopefully getting a nice amount of circulation of air around it, even though the air in our apartment right now is also really hot because it's late July in an apartment with no central air and the oven has been on for 45 minutes, <laughs> which that ended up being our final cook time is the final bake time. The point at which it seems uh, definitely moist, but set up and not raw in the center was 45 minutes for us on this day, but obviously that can be different depending on the oven and depending on the day. So yeah, we're gonna let it cool for a long time. I'm gonna give it a couple hours probably to cool so that we're not risking taking it out of the pan too early. But we'll check in in a couple hours for the moment of truth. All right, DC, well, here we are. We've given the cake four hours to cool because we wanted to be extra careful with it. My grandma told me sometimes she tried to flip it after an hour thinking, mm. oh, it'll be good. Mm. And then it's not cool yet. And truly we checked in on it about an hour into its resting time and it still was warm. You could feel it. So we gave it plenty of time and now it feels like it doesn't have any heat on it. Right, yeah, the pan is completely cool and everything. Mm -hmm. We did the bottle method, um, not upside down, not inverted, <laughs> <laughs> but we did so mount went, it on the bottle. You went strict instructions. Not against instructions. She and I talked it over on the call and she agreed that there wasn't a reason that either of us could come up with <laughs> for it to be inverted. <laughs> and again, I would love if anybody knows why that might be good or where that, I, where that came from, where that method was developed, how I am wrong for wanting to do it this way instead. Please, I would love if somebody bunt, let me know. Bunt community, sound off. Yes, bunt community, bunt scientists, please help. So now we find ourselves at the moment of truth. <gasps> I was texting mm -hmm. with her earlier Paula, my grandma, and she, I sent her a picture of the bunt on the bottle. Mm -hmm. She said, hope all is well. I can remember having the pan upside down on the ketchup bottle, kind of tilted, which again, I thought she and I agreed we weren't doing it upside down. I didn't do it upside down. <laughs> and maybe we'll see, maybe that's about to bite me, but he says, I baked so many and always held my breath until it came out. Heart eyeballs emoji. <laughs> um, so we're in that breath holding moment. Okay. Moment of truth. The bunt has had its time to cool. And now you can see it looks like it's kind of pulled away from the sides of the mm -hmm. pan a little bit. So I have hope. 
and we're going to go for it. We have to flip this sucker. So I'm going to put a large plate that is um, as big as the pan on top of it. And then in one swift movement, we're going to flip it. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ooh. <gasps> okay. Did it's you, still 100% in the pan. <laughs> it's still completely in the pan. Okay, now here's what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to flip it back over. Okay. Oh, yeah, it is in there so tight. I'm going to get a little paring knife. Great. And I'm just going to go around the edges to try to loosen it up, which, as I was sort of talking about earlier, is hard to do with a pan that has these ridges in it you know mm -hmm. it's not as simple as as a smooth pan where you can just kind of go around one surface it has all these little divots and which again is what makes it beautiful but boy it's tricky i oiled this sucker really well i think maybe them i mean i oiled the middle too listen i'm using the tiniest knife we have to try to prevent slicing up and ruining the edges but okay so I just went over on the outside and the inside around the edges to try to loosen it up we're gonna try this again oh boy yep it is still 100% in there here's what we're gonna do now DC well, now we're gonna hit it okay now we're kind of gonna oh yeah popped right out all right. okay all right i think that looks nice you can see the marbling mm -hmm. no big chunks were left in the pan i would say this qualifies as one cake intact you can see little spots of green in there that give it a little bit of its signature flair gotta take a picture for my grandma or she won't believe it No big chunks out. I would not say this is a half or a quarter cake no. or a three quarter cake. I think it's full cake. A full complete cake. And then so that you can see the full visual effect, I'll cut a little slice here for you, DC. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you can see the marbling inside. Oh, it's really moist. Very delicate. Ooh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can see or the chocolate and pistachio. Yeah, grab a plate. Kind of marble in there together. Oh, heck, I'll have some too. All right, here we go. Moment right. of truth. Here we go. Second moment of truth. <laughs> Lower stakes. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Yum. That's really good. It's so moist. Mm-hmm. Mmm. I mean, there's a decent amount of oil in there. I also think probably some of that has to do with the pudding mix of it all? Mmm, sure. Oh, good. Very good. This would be so good with coffee. Mmm. <laughs> it's really good. I see why this, this is, is a go-to. This is the number one bunt in my life. I love this bunt. It's the classic bunt I was raised on. Learned the recipe from my grandmother, mm. who learned it from her grandmother, she says. So, oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Mm-hmm. It is. It's a good little... Good little cake. The legacy continues. <laughs> well, great job, Paula, and great job, you. I will pass on. Big salute. I'll pass on the news. I think she'll be thrilled to hear that it all came out in one piece. All right, I ate one piece. Almost so all of one fast. piece in like 90 seconds. Oh my or God. Less. I now feel like I'm like, well, that was my on um, mic one. <laughs> So you would have another have piece for breakfast and another piece right now. <laughs> it's not important. <laughs> what happens off mic? <laughs> no one needs to know. Mm. Yum. Well, it's really good. Compliments to the grandma. Compliments to the grandma.
That is it. That is all for this week's episode of Stay for Dinner. Thank you to Paula. Thanks to Haley for guest hosting. You can follow her at Haley Hepworth on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow me at DC Pearson on Twitter or at D-E-E-C-E-E Pearson on Instagram for updates on the show. If you decide to cook along at home, please, please tag us. We would love to see what you make. And I can't emphasize this enough. The cake is so good. Please make it. Crack open a can of 1960s Hershey's chocolate syrup and get into it. In the meantime, please rate and subscribe to this podcast. If you haven't done so already, do that wherever you get your podcast. It helps more people find the show and that helps there be more show. I have written a couple of novels, The Boy Who Couldn't Sleep and Never Had To and Crap Kingdom. Support your local indie bookstore in whatever form they exist right now. Thanks again. Have a great week and I will talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you.